start. Um, welcome everybody to this webinar um, organized by CASA. Um, the Commercial Agriculture for Smallholders and Agribusiness, the CASA program, was set up by the UK's Department for International Development, now the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. It aims to make the commercial and development case for investing in agribusinesses that source produce from smallholders. CASA bridges evidence gaps to ensure that investors and policymakers have access to the right information and people to make inclusive agribusiness models succeed. What CASA is trying to do is to attract more investment into the sector, boosting economic growth and raising demand for smallholder produce. It does it through key areas of work in three ways, supporting market access, investor technical assistance and research for investors and policymakers. So this session is part of a three part uh, set of webinars today. Um, this, this first of three sessions is um, a part of our own uh, CASA's Agribusiness Summit. We are um, focusing this morning on how ICTs improve investment readiness for small and medium agribusinesses. So uh, before we go into the, the panelists, I'm very pleased to welcome Richard Tutin OBE, who's um, from the Foreign and Commonwealth uh, and Development Office, used to be DFID, um, changed to Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office on the 2nd of September. Um, Richard is, um, is a, a, a has ex extremely valuable uh, knowledge in this area. He's head of the Growth and Resilience Department at the FCDO, responsible for policy on economic development, urbanization, agriculture, infrastructure and manufacturing um, in FCDO and provision of cross-country technical assistance projects in these areas. He's also been the head of the International Financial Institutions Department, as well as head of the UK's government's stabilisation unit. In December 2019, he was awarded an Order of the British Empire after a 35-year career at DFID. So Richard, welcome, and we look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Alice. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, it, it, uh, I don't know whether to apologise or to share the blessings that you cannot see me, but my apologies, the technology precludes you seeing me in person. So can I just say how delighted I am to open the first of the three sessions being hosted by the UK government programme Commercial Agriculture for Smallholders and Agribusiness, CASA, uh, as you hopefully know it at this virtual AGRF agribusiness deal room. CASA seeks to increase investment in agribusiness, which trades with smallholders, and to increase smallholder engagement and benefits from agribusiness investments. A critical part of this program is aimed at working with investors to address the evidence and information gaps that are holding back investment as well as to showcase new opportunities. As you heard today, CASA will profile three new evidence papers identifying particular investment opportunity areas. The first of these now is information and communication technologies for improving investment readiness of small and medium agribusiness. Looking at how mobile technologies improve agribusiness productivity and investment readiness whilst also benefiting smallholders. The second is the effectiveness of agribusiness incubation in emerging markets, understanding how and when interventions aimed at accelerating and incubating SME agribusiness can be effective in supporting increased investment in the sector. And thirdly, bridging supply and demand for agribusiness financing, exploring different strategies for impact investors and partners to bridge the gap between the risk and reward demands of investment capital and the available supply of investment ready agribusiness in emerging markets. In each of these three panels highlighting this work, you will hear from the authors of these evidence briefs as well as directly from expert agribusiness leaders and from agribusiness investors 
profiled in the research briefs. And of course, you will have the opportunity to pitch your questions to them. So I wanted to open by setting out the key reasons for the UK government's support for increased investment in agribusiness, which trade with smallholders, focusing on Africa. You will all be aware of the central role that agriculture and the food sector play in promoting economic development, environmental sustainability, food security and nutrition. Let me just mention two. Growth in agriculture is estimated to be two to three times more effective at reducing poverty than growth originating in other sectors. And they are the biggest source of jobs in Sub-Saharan Africa. Even though the last 20 years has seen a 10% fall in the share of Africa's labor force working in agriculture, demographic growth means that the number of people working in the sector has still risen by around 75 million and will keep rising until at least 2050. Domestic and foreign investment in agriculture is growing, but the World Bank estimates that an additional $11 billion is needed annually for sub-Saharan Africa in agriculture. Africa is the only region in the world where GDP contribution from primary agriculture is higher than from agribusiness due to the fact that a relatively high share of raw materials are exported unprocessed. Whilst there is a significant demand for investment in African agribusiness and particular opportunities for investment in, Af in agro-processing, early stage African agribusiness is still seen as one of the riskiest sectors for investment in the continent. These are the reasons why the UK government has adopted an increasingly commercial approach to investing in agriculture and agribusiness, seeking to catalyze further commercial investment, fund innovation, and scale up inclusive models. Last year, UK aid was supporting almost 50 ongoing commercial agricultural programs, which had reached over 10 million smallholder farmers with the CASA program be, being key amongst these. At the end of 2018, the UK-funded Development Finance Institution, CDC, had food and agriculture investments totaling $472 million. One of our key responses to this challenge is to invest in programs supplying early stage finance, such as Ag Devco, and the Global Food and Agriculture Food Security Program, as well as to invest in local investment vehicles as we are doing in Zambia and Pakistan. We believe that these investments into early stage startup agribusinesses in Africa will feed the investment pipeline, enabling those that invest in larger ticket size operations to make investments in these agribusinesses later in their life cycle. I very much look forward to hearing the rich discussion today about the opportunities in front of the investor and investee agribusiness community, as well as from African agribusiness leaders on this panel about their investment journeys in recent years. I will now hand over to my colleague, Casas Alvaro Valverde, who authored the CASA evidence brief on ICTs for improving the investment readiness of small and medium agribusinesses so that he can take you through the key highlights of this work. Over to you, Alvaro. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much indeed for teeing us up so, so beautifully. And then before Alvaro steps in, I'm just going to uh, just give a little bit of a framing for the session and then, and then pass over to Alvaro. Um, so exactly as you say, Richard, we'll have a presentation from uh, Alvaro on the research and the key findings. And then just to let everyone know who's listening, there will be then presentations from the panelists and I'll introduce each one briefly so that they then have a few minutes to provide details from their own experience and answer a few questions. There will be a Q&A session. So while Alvaro is speaking and while the panelists are speaking, please send your questions to the organizers uh, using the chat function, um, giving your name and affiliation if you can, and they'll be passed on to the panelists. Um, 
Another quick message that we do, we will be recording this session. It will be available through the CASA website. Um, and there also is a handout which gives you details of the research that Alvaro is just about to explain. That is available um, on your app, but also will be available on the CASA website, casaprogram.com. So please do check that out. Um, I'm now passing over to Alvaro. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Marin, can you put up the slide, please? Okay, so thank you very much, Alice, and thank you very much to our wonderful keynote speaker. I would also like to thank everyone that is here on the line, as well as the panelists today. So now we'll talk about a piece of research that we have been conducting in CASA for the last few months looking into the use of ICTs and services embedded into those ICTs to improve investment readiness of SME agribusinesses. Next slide, please. So we all, we all know already that ICTs are never going to be a silver bullet for development. However, they can help with improving some of those efficiencies and resilience in global food market systems. And the services linked to those, and this is what we call agri-value-added services, can help mitigate the information, financial and market access gaps faced both by the smallholder farmers as well as the agribusiness. However, there are still some evidence gaps out there. So most part of the analysis that has been conducted has been looking into those services that have smallholder farmers as their main client. And we wanted to look more at those services that had agribusinesses as their main client, but smallholder farmers as beneficiaries and users of the service as well. And there are some other evidence gaps related to the service provision and the business model supporting it uh, to make sure that the service is sustainable in the long term. Marin, next slide, please. So we wanted to answer a big question and, and is what are those successful factors, success factors, behind the deployment of this technology and those services to help improve agribusiness productivity and investment readiness? And for that, we needed to break down the research into two different components. The first one that is really looking into the service provision and the business model. So looking into the financial sustainability, is the service breaking even? Is it actually making a profit? Is it reaching scale? What do we mean by scale, by enough scale? Scale. Is it replicable to other geographical contexts? And within the impact, we were looking both at the agribusiness investability level as well as the smallholder farmer level. So within agribusiness investability, we're looking into economic benefits derived from using these services, as well as reduce investment risks and also the carbon footprint of the agribusiness after using the services. At the smallholder farmer impact level, we're looking at increased income as well as um, socioeconomic inclusion and climate resilience. So we divided the research into two steps. So the first one was really reviewing everything that's out there. And there are between 500 and 600 services already going on in Sub-Saharan sub Africa and Asia. And we selected the ones that were mainly targeted at agribusinesses as their main clients, and those were 104. We used the categorization used by CTA last year. And what we did is a ranking based on the potential of all these services to both achieve financial sustainability, scale, as well as having a positive impact. And we interviewed 19 of the top ranked uh, services. Next slide, please. So what you can see here on the left-hand side of things, so the yellow component of it is really related to the business model and the financial sustainability and the current scale. On the blue-hand side of things, the right-hand side of things, it's related to the potential for impact of these services as well as the evaluation of that impact. So what we can see is there is a big mismatch between both. So there are things like smallholder farmer payment solutions. And if you count five from the left, that is the one that have great potential to achieve financial sustainability, but actually the impact both at the smallholder farmer level as well as the agribusiness is not that great. However, we have some others. There's another disconnect that is between the impact potential and the investment that has gone into evaluating that impact. And you can see the one that is on the, on, on the right-hand side of things which is value, value chain integrated services, and the fifth from the right, which is enterprise resource planning. Both of them have great potential to have a positive impact, but the investment into evaluating that impact hasn't been matching that potential. 
Well, if you go to the left-hand side of things, in the input market aggregator, you can see that there is less potential, but proportionally, there has been more investment. And I think as we're mentioning, that only 25% of all the services that we analyze actually invested in having some proper rigorous evaluation of their impact. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned before, there are two main categories that stand out, and actually we have two representatives from those two categories here on this panel. And those are enterprise resource planning and value chain integrated services, which have greater potential to have an impact. And that really depends on the subservice offering. So depending if they promote traceability, if they promote farmer payments, if they promote agronomic practices, so extension services and so on, not as a standalone thing, but as a bundle service to, to both the agribusiness and the smallholder farmers. And that can help improve value chain connections, agronomic practices and climate resilience, visibility and management capacities of the agribusinesses. Next slide, please. So I remember a conversation that I had many years ago with the CEO of Vodafone, where he said, well, there is a big illness going on out there in the not-for-profit sector when using ICTs for agriculture, and it's called pilotitis. And what we can see here is that every year there are more and more services coming up, and many of them die or disappear after a few years. And many of them have been relying on subsidies at the very beginning, and they want to scale up, they scale up quickly, but then they start thinking about how do we sustain the service? And they put that as a task for year two, year three of the provision of the service. So what we have seen here is that those services that are more sustainable are the ones that really depend on B2B. So they are charging the agribusiness and offering the service for free to the smallholder farmers, or they are combining both. They are doing B2B and B2C and mainly charging commissions over financial transactions for the smallholder farmers because the willingness to pay is a little bit lower. Adaptive pricing is quite important as well, depending on the bundling of those services, that each of the agribusinesses have different prices. And, uh, and, and it's, it's really important to add a business lenses to this. Even if, it, if we are talking in a development setting, at the end of the day, we're developing a business. And starting from the demand, for those services. So what is the existing demand? And what is the perfect bundle that you need to develop for that? It's going to be critical, as well as adding financial services, which always offer an additional revenue stream. Next slide, please. Okay, so scalability and replicability are often used interchangeably and they're two completely different things. So the financial sustainability of the service and the business model is going to be critical for achieving both replicability and scalability. However, that flexibility to adapt to new value chain, languages, client requirements is going to be extremely critical to be replicable and scalable. And building on available technology and not just developing an app for the, for the sake of developing an app uh, is going to lead to that success and that scalability and having a service that is as user-friendly as possible. So investing constantly in the improvement of these services is critical. And this is really, again, going to that business mindset in, in, in the sense of the more you keep investing in your service, the more you will make sure it keeps being attractive to the users and you keep gathering new users into the service and building on strategic partnerships for moving into other geographical contexts. Next slide. Okay, so for donors and investors, our recommendation um, um, emerging from this research is that there should be a focus on those successful and impactful value added services and particularly helping them improve their impact evaluations because that is kind of what is needed right now to really understand what is the subset of subservice offering that is going to help maximize that impact while bringing that return on investment. For the investor community, what we can see is there are three layers of opportunities there. So the first one is investing in the, uh, the value-added service itself, which is going to help, uh, well, sorry, in the, in the agribusinesses linked to the value-added service, and that is going to help reduce the risk of investing in, in these agribusinesses while um, increasing the return on investment. Then investing in the, uh, the value-added service itself, which is going to increase the visibility over the pipeline of investable agribusinesses and doing both things. And that is rarely done. But actually what it does is it has the benefits from the previous two, but it also gives you visibility of the technical assistance needs of your investees. 
Next slide. And this is the last one. Okay, so because we started with this research and the whole pandemic started, we added another layer to it. And what we discovered is about 60% of the, the agri-value-added services have seen an increase in demand for those services since the beginning of the pandemic. And this is a huge opportunity for investors to support the scale up of these successful and impactful services, and also for concessional finance to really support with the cash flows to those agribusinesses that are linked to the successful agri-value-added services. And that is something that is quite necessary to keep to, 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 to keep things having the impact that they were having before. And the last slide, which is, thank you very much everyone for keeping with me for these almost 10 minutes. If you want to find more information about the report, you can download it from the handouts here on, on GoToWebinar, but you can also go to the CASA program website where you will find this blog with the three pieces of research we're gonna be presenting today and far more additional information. And also contact us in case you have any follow-up questions. So thank you very much everyone. Alvaro, thank you very much indeed for outlining the research and um, re really valuable to, to get that summary and please do go and look at the research as, as Alvaro has suggested. Um, we're now going to move into the, the, the panel um, and our first panellist, um, who they're all going to be asking and um, answering particular questions uh, around the, the key success factors that mobile-based agri-value-added services need to consider. Um, and what, what will bring sufficient scale and financial sustainability. They're being asked to consider what makes their own service or if they've got one stand out from the crowd and the key factors and opportunities for investors and policymakers. So really reflecting on the, on the findings of the research. And first up is David Davis, who is the founder of AgUnity, um, FAC Global Agri Agripreneur of the Year 2018, working on the UN SDGs, elimination of poverty and increasing smallholder farmer incomes. AgUnity is a philanthropic venture applying blockchain and smartphone technology to improve the lives of small farmer cooperatives in developing countries. Widely recognized by major NGOs and winner of many ag tech and philanthropy awards and accolades. Previously, he had over a decade in senior roles at global investment banks and was the founder and CEO um, of successful startups in fintech and mobile technology, including back in 20, 2001 when mobile coverage was very low. So welcome, David, look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, in short, we take this type of, watch the screen glare, we take this type of low cost smartphone, this, this very phone I'm holding will soon be given to a farmer in New Guinea or Ethiopia or perhaps Uganda. Um, and it may be the most life-changing possession she ever owns, but it's obviously no ordinary phone. There are many thousands, millions of organizations just like CASA out there, and they all struggle with one particular challenge that we aim to solve, and that's to how you connect those organizations to the very last mile communities. I mean, the farmers that are earning a couple of dollars a day have probably never touched a phone before and live in very remote areas with low connectivity. And that's what AgUnity strives to do with, with this. Um, our phone changes farmers' lives in a way that a normal phone can't because we've gone back and redesigned it from the ground up. We replace the operating system with our own. We make sure it, we make the phone so it boots up into this uh, screen glare. It boots up into this interface with big geometric symbols and it's designed particularly that we can give this to the farmers in the highland of New Guinea and within a few minutes they kind of understand what to do you know press the green triangle when I'm handing when I'm getting cash out or press the red circle when I want to get some goods from the cooperative. Um, we solve for the poor connectivity in remote regions by making the phones work in offline mode and that's something you really have to do at the operating system level. We securely record them on the blockchain and very important to the discussion of here, we create a basic digital identity for the farmer and start recording information that would have otherwise had no records of. So the fact that the farmer has got some land, we've got the GPS coordinates of where they are. We've got a record that they're handing over, say, coca beans into a cooperative every month. So we know they've got a reliable income and those things are making the farmers loan worthy. Predominantly what we do is improve trust 
and cooperation between groups of farmers, buyers and cooperatives. And that shouldn't be understated. I mean, I grew up on a wheat farm in South Australia and, and we hand over thousands of dollars a week into a cooperative for a piece of paper and don't think anything of it. In a developed market, that transaction might not happen because of the lack of trust and record keeping. So really at the bottom, at the end of the day, Agunity is a record keeping system um, designed to fill the gap for very low income farmers. And once we'd made a solution that was useful and relevant to the farmers, we discovered that there's a vast number of organisations who had this need to connect with them. So very obviously, the organisations selling products and services, like solar lighting kits, really hard to get into the last mile. Um, banks was very important. You know, there's a number of banks that have come to us that's saying, we want to provide financial inclusion services, but we've struggled to roll it out on an app to, to the very last mile communities. Um, commodity buyers, like our biggest client, who's fair trade organisation, who want to track from the source and also collect information about what's going on in the field with their farmers. And then, of course, the NGOs like World Food Program, CASA, USAID, many others that we work for that are already investing millions of dollars in these communities, but lack the transparency on what's really happening. What, you know, how many more hours, you know, what are the kids eating now? Do they have light to educate? And we can collect all that by just pushing a simple app down onto the phone. Um, yeah, we've completed seven projects around the world now, and we've got another six in pipeline, including the ones with USAID. And we're into, so we'll be in 12, 13 countries um, as of the next couple of months around the world. Our model is a bit twofold. I mean, we collect uh, subscription and transaction fees from the farmers, but ultimately, as Alvaro was saying, we predominantly see our customers as the partner organisations, the banks, the commodity buyers, and the organisations that we work with. And then when COVID came along this year, we realised that it only took a very small pivot from what we're doing to play a vital role during the pandemic. So many of the underdeveloped countries are facing a real problem now. If you lock down, you stifle your economy, your farmers can't sell their goods, and food isn't reaching the urban areas. Whereas if you don't lock down, you let the virus run right, you get, you get ostracised by your community. So there's, there's got to be some middle ground. And we've discovered that one of the big challenges is the food distribution, food markets. And that if we can allow farmers to say with a phone, you know, I've got some pineapples and some taro that I need someone to come and pick up, then someone can go into the village in a safe way and you can keep the villages isolated, keep the food moving, keep people earning and, and reduce the risk of the virus. You can't stop the spread, but you can slow it down a little bit by doing this. So we've got multiple projects and CASA is one of, the CASA project in Uganda is one of those that we're, we're, we're writing up right now. And we have a, a substantially bigger one in Papua New Guinea that's been announced on TV with the government and, and four others that we're working on around the world. So hopefully we'll play a, a very important role during this year in the, COVID, in, in the pandemic. So thank you very much. And that's my seven minutes gone. David, thank you so much. Tremendous to hear about all the things that, that you're doing with uh, with uh, Ag Unity. And um, questions are already beginning to come in, so we'll come back to those um, at the at the end of the panel. Um, so, secondly, I want to welcome Jan Willem, who is a non-executive director of EProd Solutions Limited, which offers an enterprise resource planning tool for supplier management for SMEs. Active, um, uh, active SMEs and member-based organisations that aim at building a sustainable sourcing relationship with large numbers of suppliers in agriculture, livestock or fisheries. He has over 20 years of international work experience covering policy research, private sector development, inclusive business in ag and food security, renewable energy and public-private partnerships. Uh, Jan Willem, welcome and look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, yeah, so my name is Jan Willem Verkast. I, I uh, started my career in development, but in 2004, I started a company in Kenya sourcing from small scale farmers. So, at the moment, there's about 8,000 farmers on the contract that are linked to the export market for chili peppers. 
So at that time, when I started the company, there were hardly any IT systems available to manage uh, such operations. And luckily, my business partner was an IT specialist, so we developed systems internally. And as our basically our investment depended on it, we needed to develop a very very relevant solution that would also work in very remote places where 3G or 2G is still very, very common. So we had, of course, a lot of fears uh, depending on IT. Uh, and so we needed, um, we needed to develop systems that are very intuitive for the staff, uh, very reliable on uh, synchronizing things like that. So this system is what we developed. And um, in 2015, we learned that actually over those 11 years, there were still no off-the-shelf systems available. And we decided to, to commercialize our system. So in the meantime, there are many different IT systems available. Uh, it's a bit of a, almost like a wild growth of system. There's a lot of, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, anything that is, comes from a, from a mobile phone or a computer is all thrown on the same heap. Uh, so it's very important for companies to, to, to distinguish themselves. So in, in our case, we offer a full uh, ERP, Enterprise Resources Planning Tool, which is a full ICT platform to manage many different aspects. Now, we managed to, off, um, to offer this very affordably. We, we aim at roughly half a dollar per farmer per year, but our buyers of the licenses are uh, the aggregators and they are the ones that um, basically use the system they have the market already so our system for example is not a market information platform but as um, so we, we offer this as an, as an off-the-shelf system this is how we can keep it very affordable at the moment we are in 12 countries we are more than 20 different sectors and we have nine different languages so we build a highly, very generic, flexible system that we can very quickly configure for a client rather than that we need to customize it, basically add additional code. So because of that, we can keep it very affordable. And over the years, we have learned basically the, about the real value of the system, which is basically the data in the system. So especially financial institutions, they need to do a credit scoring of farmers. The farmers already have a market because they, the, the user of the system is offering them a market. So they can use this data for credit scoring. The repayment can be managed through checkoff. So there's a lot of things falling in place through our system. Now, often our clients, they work also with NGOs and they might receive grants, they need to report. So our system can generate those reports. And this is all information collected during the daily operations of the, of the clients, like for example, farmer payments, which for the NGO means income to farmers. And so we call this a stakeholder owned M&E platform. Now, what is the, the challenge for, for a lot of donor funded programs and also for the larger companies is that the reality on the ground is very complex. So it's actually input markets and even output markets that are together and they are interwoven. So to manage that in an effective way throughout uh, the value chain, you need integrated systems. So I think over the years we have managed to build a system which is generic, um, flexible, it can be integrated with sensor technology for quality-based payment, sensor technology for soil analysis, weather inf information services. There are many, many, offer, many different possibilities uh, there. And um, as a company, we are growing very fast. COVID has been a challenge for many companies. In our case, uh, we are benefiting from the situation because our solution helps to work remotely with farmers. We had about 75 clients working with 250,000 farmers end of last year. We expect by the end of this year to have 140 clients in 15 countries. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, well, and thank you very much indeed for giving us that snapshot of EPOD and all the work that you're doing and, and really interesting, all the very practical work you're doing to integrate um, everything and, and making it actually usable. It's all very well in theory and, and you obviously just uh, enabled it to happen in, in practice, which is the big, the big leap. Um, uh, so just finally, and we're getting lots of lovely questions coming in, keep them coming, but um, um, before we turn to the q and I'd like to welcome Professor Mohamedou Kaur, who is, um, was recently named as Vice President of Academic Affairs, Provost, or, and Professor of Information Technology and Computing at the American University of Nigeria. Previously, Professor Carr was Vice Rector, Vice President for Technology and Innovations and the Founding Dean and Professor of IT and Communications for the School of IT and Engineering at Ada University in Baku, Azerbaijan. He was also former rector uh, of the University of the Gambia, serving for six years. Um, in 2016, the University of the Gambia awarded him a Doctor of Science, and in 2015, he was honoured with an appointment as a Fellow of the Cambridge Judge Business School in the UK, also the recipient of the 2014 President of the Republic of the Gambia National Leadership Award um, and National Gambia Merit Insignia Awards, OIG and MRG. Professor Carr, welcome, and look forward to hearing your perspectives on the ICT question. We can't actually hear you, Professor Carr. I wonder if you could just try to unmute you. We can hear you now. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much for the earlier colleagues that have uh, shared their perspective. Can you hear me now? We can. Yes, um, I'm going to approach my interventions based on the questions that were shared uh, earlier. Um, when I think about how uh, we can use ICT to improve investment readiness for small and medium agribusinesses, uh, what comes to mind is to contextualize it uh, in Nigeria and in West Africa. And what I see is ICTs in agriculture, which typically people will say e-agriculture, smart agriculture, tends to focus on the enhancement of um, agriculture and rural development through improved ICT processes to collect agricultural data, manage fields, staff, improve traceability, simplify certification, contract farming, smallholder farm management, risk management, access to capital and investment, monitoring and evaluation. And these were highlighted um, earlier by the research that was provided. These increasingly becoming very, very important as we um, explore how to improve the investment readiness. Um, it's not matured in, in the West African farming ecosystem yet, uh, um, there are mobile application softwares and digital platform services that have begun uh, to come up, but they are yet to scale up or to be adaptive to the actual needs of the small farming uh, community. In, um, in Nigeria today, for example, uh, I've seen that ICTs are helping to improve the levels of productivity amongst the small hold of farmers, giving the room for entrepreneurs in the private sector to begin to create platforms of micro investments. Um, so the rise of digital platforms and services targeting smallholder farmers are very important in establishing the investment readiness. However, um, one of the challenges as has been highlighted is the lack of elements that can securitize transactions. For example, the digital identities are still limited blockchains are still in, an, in its infancy, but with an established scaling up of mapping digital identities to the small holder farmers will go a long, long way to increase trust and facilitate transactions. Um, uh, I've also seen examples of GIZ, for example, that have programs uh, in one of Nigeria's ag tech companies such as Cellulant, which use its technology to even just distribution of farming input collections of farmers' data to focus productivity at every point of harvest, such as utilization of their blockchain technologies. So I've seen these investments beginning to 
uh, to be very, very important to attract uh, micro uh, investments. The other question that was raised was what are the factors behind successful deployment of mobile technologies to improve agribusiness productivity and investment readiness while having a positive developmental impact at the smallholder farmer level? In my view, the use of mobile technologies in agriculture provides a more efficient and cost-effective method for sharing and exchanging knowledge more widely. Farmers are benefiting as they can access key information such as pest and disease reports, which are very, very important to protect investments. Also crop growth, weather conditions and market prices, especially for real-time commodity trading. And my colleague have shown a very simple phone that farmers can access. And I think scaling up that and making it user-friendly uh, becomes very, very relevant. So mobile technologies do improve communication between farmers and extension workers who are unable to visit farmers as often as both, but, uh, both, both uh, actors would like. So enhancing the communication between farmers, extension workers, researchers, and policymakers is quite essential to the improvement of yields and agricultural efficiencies along the value chain. So some of the key factors for the successful deployment of mobile technologies in my mind is one, adaptability by the farmers. Farmers must be ready to adapt to the new changes of technologies to enhance their yields and their productivity and move the goods and services to, uh, to market and to the value chains. The other factor uh, that, is uh, that is important in the deployment of mobile technologies in my mind is mobile service providers such as MTN, Safaricom, Airtel, Orange, Tigo, QCell, AfriCell, the actors in the mobile service providers in Africa must begin to support agribusiness by providing up-to-date and adequate information to extension workers, especially as, uh, as it relates to pricing. The, the pricing of access to data is very, very costly uh, when it comes to the small Hold the farmers and the actors that are support, that are, are working very hard to improve uh, yield and, and marketability. Government policies are also very important and climate change information trickling to the farmers. The other um, uh, question that was raised was examples of mobile based value added services that are targeted at agribusiness across um, uh, West Africa, for example. Uh, I will base the value addition into three different categories. One is investment services, the other is tractor services, and thirdly, educational or awareness services. Examples of mobile-based services that are helping to add value, for example, in the Nigeria's agriculture ecosystem, includes Farm Crowdy. Uh, Farm Crowdy is a very interesting startup, uh, is a platform that helps raise funds through crowdfunding for farmers. The concept is very straightforward and sometimes the lack of capital may prevent some of the small farming farm holders in showing in time for harvest. These platforms were able to raise funds for these farmers with a return on investment between 6% and 25%. The question is, how do we channel investments to make farm crowding more efficient and more scalable and more sustainability for the small farmer holders. Another example is the Grousel. This is a platform that connects farmers with global investors to ease poverty. To ease poverty. This platform is different in the sense that the farmers declare their investment needs and investors also provide a minimum of about 10% of the capital until they raise the full amount. And it has been discovered that the return on investment in this platform, Grousel is between 5 to 20 percent. Another important example is the Hello Tractor, which most people are familiar. Farmers that want to practice farming at a commercial scale, getting access to tractors and modern agricultural tools is one of the biggest problems. So Hello Tractor provides a modern overing style way to rent tractor with a simple SMS booking platforms. You also have the CFI e-learning platform, which is based in Nigeria. 
This was specifically created by Corporate Farmers International to educate and provide knowledge for young agripreneurs, farmers and extension workers across the value chain. This will further strengthen the agro-education within, for example, Nigeria's tertiary institutions, especially the colleges of agriculture. Lastly, from my experience, the key success factors that mobile based at value added services needs to consider doing is they need to enhance awareness, ease of use, take advantage of emerging technologies such as AI and machine learning for the localization of interfaces and intractability of farmers and users adapted to their local languages with smart algorithms and natural languages, especially with voice commands for access and use of information. These are very, very important elements in addition to establishing what I call ag Tibets. These are agricultural Tibet institutions. If this can be populated across farming communities as core components of the agriculture and smallholder farmers value chain and ecosystem, it will facilitate appropriate training and skilling up of young and emerging farmers who will be attracted to these emerging technologies as future developers of mobile and digital technologies and services, as well as to be ag technicians and entrepreneurs with the right mindset to harness digital technologies right. and services right. and be drivers right. of efficient value chains and champions of agribusiness. Brilliant. What they should be doing, Thank you. Thank you very um, much they, indeed. Thank you. Very, very right. comprehensive. I'll Thank stop. you so very much. That's that's a, that's a great uh, tour of, of, of many of the activities that are out there. And thank you so much for that, Professor Carr. Um, I wanted to turn to some of the questions that are coming in. We've got um, about 15 minutes left, just short of 15 minutes. Um, one of the first ones is really about the sort of practicalities of access in um, in rural areas and the connectivity. And, and um, one of the questions coming in from Leonard Maliki, how is digital technology changing farming um, in deep rural areas with limited connectivity? So I wondered if both Albert, you could mention what, what it found in terms of the research and how limiting that factor is. And perhaps Jan Willem and David could also uh, explore where you see that constraint still being a, a big factor. I think I'll actually uh, point you into Jan Willem and David because they have more experience in terms of the practicalities. But what we have seen is that if you just push a smartphone with 3G or 4G or whatever, you're not going to get the coverage in the rural areas, that's for sure. And that is what they are both trying to achieve with the offline functionality, right? I mean, Jan Willem, do you yeah. want to respond to that, for example? Sure, yeah, thank you very much. So, in indeed, um, Internet speed is a, is a big challenge. So we built uh, the system to have uh, offline functionality. Um, and our system would be used by the, by the staff of the buyer who would um, can afford a simple smartphone uh, with the moment we accept up to Android 4, which is really, really old, it's eight years old. So even Android 4 still works on our uh, platform. Um, the farmers would receive communication through SMS, while the data collection can be done through through the old smartphones. Offline, when they have internet, they can synchronize through uh, the cloud. Um, even our desktop application for the office basically works offline, except when you're downloading the latest uh, software releases, obviously when you're downloading uh, weather information, things like that through the APIs. But basically, if you have no internet, you can uh, you can still uh, use both perfectly. And obviously it's important to synchronize every now and then. If there's really no internet at all, as in some of our areas, uh, you could actually also synchronize through Bluetooth or, or different options in the office directly. Fantastic. Thank you, Yamil. I mean, that actually addresses a question um, which Maxine Barnett also raised about, about that off, offline um, synchronization. Um, David, your perspective on, on that, in terms of the, the anything to add in, in terms of that connectivity, probably similar similar story for you. We can't, we can't actually hear you, David. I wonder if that's your end muting or us. 
we can just you, you seem to be on mute David can't hear you at the moment unfortunately okay that's what are we there No, unfortunately, and unfortunately, we still can't can't hear you. Perhaps we'll, we'll we'll get that sorted, and then we'll come back to you, David, if that's all right. Um, a question around um fintech and around um actually investment in the fintech story. So a question from um Andrew Mugri, um financing of fintech platforms to reach um, SMEs. Uh, is is there fun, funding that's that's uh, lining up to provide that finance, and how do you? Find it. Obviously, the research that Alvaro did showed that um, funding for, for value-adding services and then funding for investors that are uh, that smallholders that use those value-adding services are two quite different things. Do you find that people are investing in that fintech, and, and what's your experience of that? Um, David, we'll come back to you and see if we can hear you this time, and then we'll go to uh, Professor Carr and Jan Willem after that. Yeah, I feel we, we know fintech and we've had startups in that area before, so we know how to progress that. Our problem is when you take an impact venture that's working with developing world farmers to traditional fintech investors, it, it's a foreign world to them. They can't understand why trust would be an issue, why there's communication challenges. And so we find we have a whole raft of things to explain to them. And then along with that, we have to get them on board with our business model. And that's been a long journey, but we, we have quite an um, extensive in, investor portfolio now, and we're finding we're working up the food chain. But really the challenge is to make sure that they understand the opportunity. So you either got to take people from impact world and get them cognizant with fintech world, or you go from the much richer fintech world. I mean, there's ridiculous amounts of money in, in fintech circles, but then you have to educate them about impact and developing world farmers and yes. you know even simple things what yes. explaining what what um, um, SDGs are. I, I, I made that mistake many times talking in investor presentations and I rattle out SDG like everyone should know. And you get to the end of the presentation, they go, what's an SDG? Um, yes. So it's, it's, it's yes. interesting who yes. you pick. Yeah. The challenge, absolutely, absolutely. Um, no, really interesting. Um, and and very brief thought on that to you, to you, Professor Carr. And we we we're short, short, very short of time, unfortunately. But what's your perspective on that angle? Um, Sorry, no, no, you're on mute. Professor yes, Kana, you're on mute. We can hear you. Yes, can you hear me now? We yes. can, thank you. Yes, yes, quickly, I said I agree with uh, the perspective shared so far. But in Nigeria, what I have observed is there is gradual movement of incorporating fintech. For example, the example I've cited the farm crowdy and the Grousel. The farm crowd is using fintech from the crowdfunding perspective and they're able to see some capital movement to some of the farmers that has begun to return um, investment returns around 6 to 25%. And on yes. the grouse cell platforms created where um, they're able to attract global investors um, uh, where in this case, the investor will provide a minimum of 10% of the capital needed. So there are little movements, but because there is lack of trust and yes. lack trust of security many, raising. Many times, yes. Yeah, no, fantastic. No, but thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and apologies that we, we lost a little bit of question time um, through, the, through the, the glitch, but um, I think we covered a lot of the ground um, and, and we uh, really appreciate uh, all of the time that you put in. Listeners who are still with us, please join us for the other two um, CASA sessions, if you can, um, later on in the day. Um, and just to mention that CASA is running some agribusiness breakthrough webinars. So every Wednesday, uh, first Wednesday of the month, not every Wednesday, every first Wednesday of the month, 
there will be some research and some um, and some webinar discussion around a particular uh, research. So so please do look on the events part of the CASA website to to, to to look and see what other discussions are going on. Um, but thank you all so very much. Apologies that we broke off and came back, but um, I hope the recording will be available and we'll patch that together. Um, and and really appreciate all of the insights that you've shared today. And thank you also to Richard Tutin if you're still with us for our keynote speech. But um, thank you to all our speakers and um, we look forward to connecting up with you perhaps on the CASA website, casaprogram.com. Thank you all and uh, look thank forward you. to again. Thank you.